100 years ago, a beautiful empire built on black excellence was booming. Black Wall Street, it was a sight to be seen. Until one day, it was all burned to the ground. But fire is no match for the fire within black dreamers everywhere. And so, new Black Wall Streets rise. City is committed to helping build black businesses through banking. Good evening. I'm Diane Lewis, the Executive Vice President and Chief Programming Officer for the Paley Center for Media. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Paley Impact event, The Storytellers, Preserving the Legacy of Iconic Black Musicians. Yeah. <laughs> we got a good crowd. This evening's event is part of the Paley Center celebration of Black History Month. We invite you to visit our multimedia exhibition in the Spielberg Gallery, just upstairs, which salutes black achievements in music on television. The exhibition highlights some of the most memorable television performances by black artists and features authentic costumes and original artifacts, including one of Louis Armstrong's original trumpets, a Chuck Berry Gibson guitar, Roberta Flack's Lifetime Grammy Award, and so much more. Oh, it's going to be a good panel, too. <laughs> we are thrilled to add to that exhibition by bringing together some of the finest storytellers here to discuss and show some of their work in preserving the legacy of some of the most impactful black musical artists. Our esteemed panel tonight includes Academy Award nominated Emmy-winning producer and director, Lisa Cortez. Lisa is also the director of Little Richard, I Am Everything, which premiered in January at Sundance and was bought by Magnolia Pictures on its premiere screening night. Quite a feat. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa will be joined by the also Academy Award nominated and Emmy Award winning media executive and producer Julie Anderson. Among other topics, Julie will speak about her film Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues, which was just released on Apple TV a few months ago. It was, it's quite a good film. Our third panelist was one of the very first to bring a new genre known as hip hop to the, yes, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> 50 years, um, hip hop to the TV watching public beginning in the early 80s. Ralph McDaniels is the creator and co-host of the show Video Music Box, which was so groundbreaking to the hip hop community that it had had a 2021 Showtime documentary made about his impact called You're Watching Video Music Box, that will be tonight, too. Yeah. And our last panelist is award-winning author, producer, director, and musician Anton Antonino Ambrosio. Most recently, Antonino was the director of American Masters' Roberta Flack, which aired on PBS in January. So a lot of new stuff, too. Yeah. Our incredible panel tonight is made possible Thanks to the sponsor of Paley's Black History Month Celebration City, and I just want to also give them their great partner. I am now pleased to introduce you to our moderator for the discussion, Torre. Torre, <laughs> Torre has been recognized around the country as the co-host of MSNBC's The Cycle, a host on MTV and BET, and as correspondent at CNN. You may have also seen his work in Rolling Stone, The New York Times, and The New Yorker, which is just to name a few. He is currently a host and creative director at The Grio and the host of the podcast, The Torre Show, which has more than four million downloads. Please join me in welcoming Torre. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for coming out. I'm Torre. We're going to have an extraordinary event for you tonight. We've got an extraordinary group of people here to talk about film. Um, let's bring out the panelists and get started. We have uh, Julie Anderson, who's the executive producer of Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues, an extraordinary documentary on Apple right now. Welcome. 
We have the legendary Uncle Ralph McDaniels from Video Music Box. We have the director of Little Richard, I Am Everything, Lisa Cortez. Party won't start till you get here. <laughs> oh, about that. And Antonino D'Ambrosio, who made the extraordinary American Masters, Roberta Flack. So thanks, you guys, for coming. Um, you know, sometimes we chase a project, we chase the rabbit, and we finally <laughs> nail it down. And sometimes the rabbit sort of comes to us and says, you're gonna do this now. So I'm curious for you guys why you did this now. And Lisa, since I've known you longest, I want to start with you. You made this extraordinary Little Richard documentary. Why now? Why did it happen for you now? Because it hadn't been done. And so as a filmmaker, there's always that challenge of being the first to go in and interrogate a story um, and to really find a fresh way of looking at Richard's life and all of the cultural benefits that we have as a result of him affecting music and transgressiveness. Um, but I, so why now? Because there are a lot of forces out there saying that our history doesn't matter. Mm. And I think you know f all of our films are so important because they position movements, mm -hmm. individuals who are icons, not just because of performance, but they're icons because they have changed the way how we see ourselves, how we dream about ourselves, and just the possibility that comes along. Mm -hmm. Ralph, you had, of course, an iconic show, but then years later, a Nas comes along and says, let's make a documentary <laughs> about it. Did it happen because you were looking for someone to help tell a story or because Nas, old friend, was like, now's the time to make something about your show? No, I definitely wanted to, to do it. And I was shopping around, I went to uh, HBO and um, this was right before the pandemic hit. And they were like, yeah, we wanna do it. We wanna do four parts. And I said, all right, awesome. And I reached out to my friend, Sasha Jenkins, who's done a bunch of films on, on hip hop. Say, I want you to direct it. And, um, and then we sat there and I watched people die during the pandemic. And I was like this, like, uh, we gotta get this film done because people that I wanna interview are dying as this thing is going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wanna mm -hmm. tell my story and I'm getting older. And I wanted, I've told everybody else's story throughout my years, but I want to tell who I am. I want people to know who I am. Yeah. You know, like Jay-Z says, I didn't know that about you. I'm like, right, because I never said it. I just interviewed you. The mic was always going towards you. And so I, I thought it was time for the sake of my family and the legacy of McDaniels that we tell my story. Beautiful. Julie, uh, I mean, it's always a good time to talk about Louis Armstrong, yeah. uh, <laughs> but why did you do this now? Uh, well, I think one of the most important things that all of us probably went through is um, when you do a documentary about someone who is uh, famous in some genre, there's a whole life that you don't know, that you haven't met, right? But what you do need is you need the cooperation of the estate or the family or somebody, and those are very tricky to get. And in the case of Louis Armstrong, they were not going to give it up to anybody. And our production company was Imagine, and they spent a long time talking with the Louis Armstrong Foundation, talking with the curator of all of the materials, figuring out what was there and could we have access to all of it. So there's a lot of planning that goes into making a film about someone like that early, early on. And that's the only way you're going to be able to make a really great film, is with the cooperation of the people who own all of that material. Yeah, that becomes really important. And when those folks are willing to have you tell the real story and the true story, then yeah. you can do something. Trust you to tell the true story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's actually a great word for yeah. it. So uh, why Roberta Fleck now? I, it's interesting that uh, it was, I've listening to my fe fellow panelists whose work I admire is that, you know, I think the common theme is you want, to, you want to do work that really, for me, that puts humanity back into the center of the ring, mm -hmm. especially what's been happening the last, you know, six, seven years. And 
I had come off two films, one uh, about Johnny Cash and a record he made on behalf of Native people that was censored called Bitter Tears and then a film about Frank Serpico, famous whistleblower. And Roberta had seen these films. And so she had reached out to me to come and talk to her about what we could do together because she, she had had a stroke and she was feeling like there, was, there had to be some way to, to tell a story, you know, of, about her life, but in the way that she kind of had seen how, what I call creative response, is my, my filmmaking, you know, what I call creative response. And this is this, this thing where projects choose you sometimes mm -hmm. because this wasn't something that was front of mind. I loved her. My parents were immigrants. My mom, who didn't really speak English, would dance to her music. I remember that as a little boy and think this is just, this is all about love. And then when I met Roberta, the first thing she said to me is that, I wanna tell you that love is a song. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> and this is what, because she sets the tone. Mm -hmm. And then she said, what I want you to do is just be quiet and listen to music with, for, with me for two hours. <laughs> and then she pulled out these old reels, cool. Donny Hathaway, you know, wow. for, for that first take, which is the, her big record, and we just sat there for two hours. That sounds fun. And then when I got up, I thought, this is, you know, whatever happens here, this has been the greatest fucking experience. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had a private audience, because she was, Tori, she was holding my hand, singing, and I'm like, this is, what's happening here? <laughs> and I'm just like, this is amazing. You need a camera on that. I was just, yeah, I mean, this, it's like in my mind, so I got up to leave and she said, you have respect, you're gonna make this movie. And that was it. And then we started making the movie and the pandemic happened like it did to all of us. But um, we had to shift, but yeah. But kind of like what Julie mentioned about trust, that a connection was made yes. with the subject, with the family, yeah. and they are able to say, okay, I trust, I connect with you, so I'm gonna let you, you run with this, right? I mean, that's the only way it can, you know, for, for me, I don't know, the subjects, Ralph could speak more because some of his subjects are, are still alive or people he's worked with, but she's still alive. And so she never gave up control of anything. Right. She produced like all her own records. But with me, she said, this is going to be your story now. And so it was just one of those moments where one of the greatest artists that I've ever encountered was saying, let's collaborate, but you know, now you're gonna make it. And that, that trust that she just you know, kind of gave over more easily than I thought, it's like a precious thing that you have to honor. Yes. Um, the, the subjects of these docs are really interesting, fascinating, powerful. And these docs are all very different, even though there's a similarity in the subject, but they're very different. And I wonder how the music that's at the center of the subject that you're covering shapes the look and the structure that you go into. I'll start with you, Julie, because your film has a bright exuberance to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it was made yesterday, which it shouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. But it looks very fresh and alive. So talk about how, I mean, like the, the exuberance of Armstrong comes through in the look of the picture. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's see. Um... There honestly is not a lot of footage of Louis Armstrong not on a stage performing. Wow. There are hundreds of still photos, and we had, to, we, we had to get some film. We found it at the Rutgers Institute that no one had looked at for years that was mixed up in cans, and it was starting to decay, and you could smell it. And the only reason I got them to give it to us was because it was decaying. And I said, you know, it's ir irreversible. If you don't do it, you're gonna lose that mm -hmm. footage. So, um, so a lot of the material was very, uh, like film, it was beautiful, beautiful, and stuff no one had ever seen before. And um, we even, on the, on the theatrical release, we even had the lower thirds were made to look like they were film, they were, like they were optical. And I noticed that on Apple, they're a little bit less extraordinary. So we, <laughs> yeah, we tried to keep the look very much of the time. Mm -hmm. And Lewis died in 1971, so, and it's, the mm -hmm. film begins in 1900. So it was a very filmic look throughout. Um, yeah, I think 
Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're working with a lot of old, old material. Some of it's black and white, some of it's color. And I think we really tried to stay there, but we didn't want the film to feel old to younger people no. at the same time. And I think that the animations throughout the film maybe helped that because Lewis was an artist and we took some of his scrapbooks and animated them to help tell the stories. Um, Ralph, for some reason, the the doc you guys made with Sasha, it feels hip hop visually mm -hmm. to me. And I don't really know why I conclude that, but I'm like, this it looks like it fits the culture. Like, what is going on there? Um, I have 20,000 hours of content <laughs> <laughs> that I've shot since 1983. I started Video Music Box in 1983, wow. which was um, great for, the, the, uh, for Nas because he could go through anything and just figure out and how he to- He probably already saw a lot of it. A lot of it he grew up watching, oh, right. Yeah. And so um, I couldn't help but it to look like that. But um, one of the things I did want to you know, tell was my story where you know, I'm not from the Bronx. I didn't grow up in hip hop you know, right in the beginning of it. You know, I was there, but I was in Queens and I was in Brooklyn. So was, to me, it was a different experience. At the height of Video Music Box, how old are you? I was 21. Oh, and I was 21 when it started. So at the height, I was 30. Lisa, you, you guys have an exuberance visually that fits Little Richard and a speed to the piece that fits the Little Richard experience. And I'm <laughs> like, I feel like I'm at a concert. It's very exciting. Like, talk about how you came up with what you wanted to do visually that, that would live up to this amazing man. Well, I knew in starting the project that I wanted to give Richard agency to tell his story. And so it's funny when I heard Julie talk about finding this reel that's decaying. For uh, all of us filmmakers here, we geek out on this. <laughs> like, oh my god, it's never been seen before. Um, we get very excited. And, and we do strange things like crawl in basements, and there's all sorts of nasty stuff, because we have heard there's a tape or, or a picture or something that's so, so special. So um, you know, it, it, it started, the, the, fa the structural foundation was, Let's find archival footage and appearances of Richard uh, throughout his life. And what's amazing is in 1955, with the advent of Tutti Frutti, it's also the advent of the rock and roll movie. So there's documentation of him from the beginning of his career. And then when he goes to England, you know, there's great BBC stuff. And then he's on all these talk shows. So we were able to chart. Richard's evolution and his challenges and his joy through him. And, and that was so important for someone who, as we hear in the story, um, did not always feel recognized. One of the visual motifs that we use in the film is that of a quasar exploding and just this crazy cosmology. Because Richard, you know, as one of the architects of rock and roll, yes. which was such an explosive movement that happens at the same time that the teenager is born, is like, it's a whole new world that is happening and formed. And so to have a supernova exploding and then the stardust falling to Earth were kind of visual tropes that I leaned into to illustrate what it must have felt like when he introduced this most incredible art form and export, um, because it's not just the music. It's also the man with the pompadour and the little penciled in <laughs> mushroom, uh, mustache and the makeup and the flamboyance in 1955, which is still a very conservative time. You make a really interesting point, too, that the rise of Little Richard coincides with the rise of car culture. So people, teenagers especially, are encountering music in another setting. So that, that we have a proliferation of cars is part of why radio gets a larger platform and Little Richard gets a larger platform. Yeah, the, the, you know, you're in your car, you turn on the radio, you could be a white kid who is, you know, our country is segregated and you're hearing this music. 
like John Waters said, like this was a soundtrack of his life. And when he discovered it, it changed like so much for him. So, you know, it's, we think of the, we look at the cultural product, but we sometimes don't see the context right. of how the person and the music are entering into a, a conversation and moving that conversation forward. And that simple moment of turning on the radio and hearing him was explosive, not only for you know the, those lucky folks, but also for so many musicians that we then start to trace who were directly impacted by his well, I, presence. I, I want to talk about that because you make some fascinating connections. You're doing an American Masters, right? So that that opportunity is a little bit different than what some of the other folks are dealing with. And that American Masters has been on television for what decades, right? Is yeah. the, is there a structure that they're offering to you or suggesting to you that you're okay? I can do this, but then because your look and feel is is different than the other folks, and it should be, right? It, it it's it, it's a little more loose and free, you know, visually and structurally. Um, so talk about talk about some of those ideas. Yeah, that's um, that came out of uh, they pretty much left me alone. So it, you know, luckily, in that regard, and that came out of like trying to figure out what how we're going to make this film when the pandemic hit because Roberta was was old, Jesse Jackson, all the people we were working with, you know, they were they were a vulnerable population of folks, and yeah. and so you know, at some point we just decided kind of also getting back to your early question about the music influencing it. Um, we just were, you know, I wanted to really run free, you know, it's like being her mind and her heart. You know, that's why the film is m mostly in her voice all the way through. And um, <coughs> the other thing is, is that, because uh, with the split screens and all the counterintuitive footage that I use and, 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 the, and all the different kind of modalities and tones of music, but one thing that was really important to me is that, you know, how I approach it is that I see the music and hear the images. That's just always the way that I've approached the work. Okay. And so for her, one thing that really upset, you know, was upsetting to me was she was considered to be soft, like her music was soft and not serious. Mm. But, you know, all of us that know her music know that she's like a major force in soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, I wanted to really put that down that this woman is a found like she is a founder of soul mm -hmm. among other things that she did because she just was a badass straight through so i wanted to capture the fact that what people were missing in her music what they would think what they saw as softness was real power real power julie i felt really seen watching your film because um of what uh winton is saying what Winton marsalis is saying early on I remember learning about Louis Armstrong, right, at a time when Malcolm X is huge in my mind and in the culture and other people like that. So we're looking at Louis Armstrong, we're like, I don't want to, I like this grinning, like, is he toming? Like, what's going on with this guy? He's, he's too happy. Like, I'm, I'm not riding with that. I'm riding with Malcolm X. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. When is, and, I'm, and later, then it was like, oh my God, like, learn more about jazz. And like, Pops is amazing. He's the legend. He's not like, he's, he's not step and fetch it. He's genius, yeah. right? And, and, you know, I didn't really talk about it because I didn't, was embarrassed to have thought wrong of him. And Winton is saying the same thing. Yeah. That right off the bat, he's like, Dad, I do not want to listen to this grinning, smiling. Yeah. And then finally, when he gets inside the actual music, he's like, yeah. yo, this is incredible. Yeah, that's a great story. And, and I think that is part of what made Lewis's life so complex and interesting, being an early, early, early extremely popular black performer who's performing for white audiences. And Lewis was born in 1900, so when the 50s, 60s came around, he, had, he was at the peak of his fame, and he had broken through a lot of doors that people did not realize he had broken through. Yeah. And there he was, his generation, he was grinning ear to ear all the time. He was playing with black music, white musicians. He was hobnobbing with them and being silly with them on the stage. And, um, the younger generation considered that very Uncle Tommy. Like, why are you sucking up and being so easygoing with the white folks, right? And so Lewis had to live through a lot of that. And that was a really important part of our film in terms of race, because we wanted to look at 
Lewis through his music as well as through his life's influences and, and, the, and what he had to go through, a lot of people didn't realize that, mm. you know, he would, be go, he would be playing for royalty in England. He'd be playing for kings in, in Germany and he would come home and he would play at places he couldn't stay. Mm -hmm. And he would show up in a tuxedo and, and the doorman would say, I'm sorry, sir, you have to go around to the back, you know? And he's a world class star. But so, then later he uses his power to say, yeah. if I'm going to play here, then I got to be able to stay here. That's what he said. He told his manager eventually, he said, I'm not going to play anywhere I can't stay. But he had the power to do that then. You know, 20 years before that, he didn't have the power to do that. So he earned this stardom by being very affable and people assumed that that was what he was doing, but he was surviving and he understood exactly what was happening. Uh, Ralph, you know, one of the things that set your show apart was the shout outs. You guys <laughs> talk about this in the documentary. Mm -hmm. um, the shout out part, which I think I didn't understand as a, <laughs> as a young person watching the show. I'm like, let's hear more from the artists. But the shout outs were really important. I mean, you were doing a local show, right? Right. It's not Yo! MTV Raps was right. meant to speak to the nation. You were doing a New York show, right? Which us in Boston, Detroit, et cetera, were able to get various ways. But like, that, was, that stuff was really important. And sometimes you had people shouting out their husband in prison. Baby mama, baby father. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know who you are. Who you are. <laughs> but the, sh the shout out section was really, and, and I think it made a lot of people feel like it was, it was their show. Yeah, there was an interaction, you know, with the audience because we would go to venues and we'd have, you know, big name artists that were popular and we'd, you know, do interviews and the audience would literally be right there, just like how you are here today. And then I'd finish the interview and they'd still be standing and I'm like, okay, so what's going on? And they'd be like, so when are you going to do our part, the shout out? <laughs> and, uh, so I'd go in the crowd and literally in the middle of the crowd and turn the light on and everybody would say, oh, shout out to my friend, you know, Jamel from the Bronx and big up my baby mama, you know, and this and that, you know who you are, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and that was, um, that was, it, they felt proud because then it came on TV. Yeah. And it, you know, cause they would do, we were in a club on Wednesday and then on Friday I played that. And they would be like, you a celebrity on your block. You know, like I saw you on Video Music Block. And you said, you know, you shouted out all the crew. Yo, you, and so that made people feel good. And that was, um, and the shout out was something that, you know, when I started it, you know, and I, I hear people say that word. Before that, nobody said shout out. Like those two words together. Before and, your show. Right. And so, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, it's claimed that Mr. Magic said it at one time, but I didn't hear him say it. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Magic. <laughs> I never heard Mr. that. Mr. Magic is a, uh, was a radio personality, came on late night, amazing person. And, you know, so when I started doing the whole shout out thing, you know, everybody was like, oh, this, what is that? You know, like, you know, what is this? And people said, okay. And everybody kind of, you know, started doing it. And I remember Chris Rock was doing a, a, a HBO special and he said, some girl was in the audience, she said, I want to do a shout out. And he was like, this ain't video music box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I see people all the time and I hear people say it all the time. Like, you know, I want to give a shout out. You know, you know, you know, everybody does it. You know, it's become American language mm -hmm. and, but that's hip hop. When you hear that word shout out, that comes out of hip hop. No doubt. Yeah. One of the great, many great moments in your piece comes toward the end when this sister says, um, you know, what does it do to rock and roll to know that its pioneers are black and queer people? And I think rock and roll has fully accepted that black people are the progenitors of rock and roll, but they ain't really wrestle with <laughs> that it's queer folks, right? And not just, not just Richard, but when you go through the montage toward the end, and it's Mick Jagger and Harry Styles and Elton John and uh, uh, you know Guns and Roses and what it's like. Oh my God! There's all these people who are performing queerness. Maybe they don't even realize it. Maybe the audience doesn't realize it. But that's what's happening. And it is this powerful way of almost shifting my understanding of what's really going on with rock and roll. 
Well, you know, I think when I look at the timeline, you know, I look at Richard and then I go back and I'm looking at Big Mama Thornton and I'm looking at Escarita and I'm looking at Richard performing in drag shows and drag culture. Like, drag culture, queer people here, you know, it's not a, a it's not something wokeness is trying to, uh, you know, <laughs> put forward as an agenda. And so I think it was very important with this film because you know rock and roll is it, like hip hop is one of our great exports to sure, the world, sure. and to understand and give respect to um, the architects and that the architects are not these heteronormative white men, um, but the face of them are is Richard, it is uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp. Um, and all of the other people who he drew upon um, to create his his own unique style. No, I, I love that part of the film. You, when you start talking about Donny Hathaway, who's an important part of the Roberta Flack story, mm -hmm. and 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 it, the film goes in a slightly different direction because because Roberta Flack is so like, you know, focused on the craft, mm -hmm. focused on love. Her relationship with her husband is so beautiful. Donny Hathaway is going one of the great voices yep. of our time, but personally suffering, right? And when you, you know, you had this great bite where he's like, you know, white people are trying to steal my music. And I'm like, amen, brother. And he's like, they got wires hooked up to my brain. I'm like, oh, no, no. <laughs> You're talking about it in a different way than I thought you meant. Because the white man is trying to steal your music, but not in that way. Yeah. Um, Unless he saw something we couldn't see. But, but, yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, talk about... About that, that I part. mean, you know, what's, I think we, we can all talk about this, you know, a great artist is not great without great people around them and extraordinary people. And the thing that Roberta was able to do is, whether it was with Donnie or Luther um, and a bunch of other people she mentored, is that she was able to identify these, 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 these folks. And in Donnie's case in particular, he was from D.C., he had gone through segregation like she did. If he grew up in the church and had this, this soul background, but um, there was a, something that this particular uh, popular culture, what happened for him, like she talks about in the film, he couldn't handle. And some of that had to do with things that we couldn't really deeply explore in the film because of the, just the limitations of the format um, with her, his own struggles of who he th saw himself as. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that kind of combination was combustible. The talent with this, uh, this kind of superstardom, with this kind of insecurity about who you really are, and then you're living in this really racist society. Yeah. And, you know, as I mentioned to you before we came on stage, this was a moment in, in American um, medicine when they were labeling black men schizophrenic. Right, as and a they, form of controlling them. Yeah, as a them. form of controlling them. And they labeled him schizophrenic. And I think part of his white people are trying to steal my ideas was his resistance to this, this control. Unfortunately, it led to his, you know, his suicide. Um, Lisa, one last thing. So most of these pieces tell the story straight, right? We're just seeing Roberta, Donnie telling the story. We're just seeing Lewis. There's one moment from you at the 27 minute mark that kind of like blew me open a little bit. <laughs> you're doing Richard, Richard, Richard. And then you reach a moment where you're trying to describe and show basically like explosiveness. And we don't just get, we get this montage that's Richard, but it's also sperm and plants being bored and stars <laughs> exploding. And, and it's very sort of like, it's almost what a fictional director would do, right? To like give you the feeling that I'm trying to write. So talk about why, I feel like there you chose to diverge from the traditional documentary form to like give you the feeling that you were trying to get at that Richard is doing, that the film is doing. So why'd you do that there? Well, in telling the story, I was always looking for ways that I could break through the fourth wall and break through like, this is how you tell the music mm. bio doc. Because Richard, his essence, his contributions are not stagnant. They, we are still the beneficiaries of what he unleashed and gave to all of us. And so I wanted to play with the form and find a way 
to translate just how all of one's being and senses um, opened up by the exposure to something we had never heard before that was past, present, and future in um, the messaging and, and vibrance. And so, you know, giraffes licking one another and um, <laughs> plants, you know, and fat, fat, fast motion, like all those things were just ways to give us a sense of how different and exciting um, it, he was. You know, because we, so many of us remember, shut up, shut up, you know, Richard as a caricature, Richard on talk shows um, making jokes. And I, I think people, you know, many contemporary audiences, let me say, do not know the depth of his contributions, the artists he influenced from the Beatles, who opened for him, the Rolling Stones, Mick Hendrix. Jack, you know, Hendrix plays in his band, he brings James Brown There's into a the story world. From Alan Leeds' book about James, who's managed James Brown, that, you know, in the early days, they didn't always know what little Richard looked like in every small town. And there were a couple of times when Richard couldn't get there, and James Brown went on stage and pretended to <laughs> as be little Richard. Richard, and they didn't know. Yeah, because <laughs> Richard goes to Hollywood to do movies, and he had brought James to Macon. That's where Richard, where James records his hits, mm -hmm. his first hit breakout. So they had this relationship. So he's like, I can't do it, man. Go get you do it. You do the show. So, but so, you know, there's he he's his I always say his DNA is everywhere. Right. And that DNA is so, it's like a, it, there's a cosmology that goes with it. And so that visual montage and some of the other things that we created. And, you know, I worked with incredible editors who just, I was like, I want to translate this. And we just had so much fun um, finding a way to, um, uh, you know, show the legacy, uh, the joy and and the pain that was inherent in his his story. I, I, I talked about some of that stuff um, when I was doing my work on Prince because people always looked to James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, and they know his real father is Little Richard. And when you put the two of them side by side, you're like, oh, he's doing Little Richard. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this has been extraordinary. Thank you guys for coming. Happy Black History Month, <laughs> Julie, Ralph, Lisa, Antonio. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.